Well, it's great to it's great to be here, as my uh, self written blurb <laughs> suggested. Um, and that we're we we'll started a little bit late, but the good news is, um, I think 40 minutes, 10 slides, that seems really quite doable. So probably still time for questions at the end. Um, I'm gonna start with a few explainers. Um, if you don't know what CRVS is, uh, if you don't know who Plan is, we'll just go through that just quickly before we move forward. And you also know that it, there's a slight difference from the slide to the program. The program talks about open CRVS and I've purposely put eCRVS up here and hopefully that'll, the reason for that will become a little evident as we go along. So firstly, civil registration and vital statistics. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about interoperability and interconnection. In CRVS, there's, there's one there already. Civil, re civil registration refers to births, deaths, marriages, divorces, and adoptions. So significant life events. And it's often managed at a government level um, by registrars general or attorneys general. It has a, it's kind of has a basis in law, citizenship. It's treated as a legal issue. Um, vital statistics, obviously the statistics that are driven by those things, often managed by departments of statistics. And so immediately you've got this kind of cross-government uh, issue going on in CRVS. Even in regional support services, if we look at where CRVS sits within SPC, um, the, the technical support, there's one person and it's in the statistics division. Uh, it's not in the health division. Um, that person, uh, by the way, Jeff Montgomery is the previous um, Registrar General of New Zealand and Chair of the Regional Network that looks after CRVS. He's a big advocate for ECR, ECRVS. I'm titling this to start with around just electronic or digital CRVS um, because whilst I'll talk to you uh, at for, for, for a little while about open CRVS, which is one particular product, we we'll go back to the slide that I think Michael put up about all the different products in the digital health space. There are also other products in the CRVS space. And at plan, if a government decides to go down a digital CRVS space, does all their due diligence, maps out the system, creates a great um, interoperable system, and it's not open CRVS, for us, that's still a win. We don't actually mind if people choose a different product. It's about um, that improvement that can happen by doing EC CRVS. So, See if I can, yeah, always good at a digital conference to be able to work the IT. Um, so Plan International, where if you haven't heard of us, that's okay. Um, we've been around for quite a while. Actually, our origin story is looking after orphans in the Spanish Civil War. Um, so quite a, a while ago, and we've moved um, forward from there, but we've retained our interest in child rights and um, especially these days, equality for girls. For the work that we've been doing for many, many years, we realise that not all children realise all their rights um, and particularly girls face a problem in a range of spaces around, around equality of access to education and other life, um, important life issues. We've been involved for a long, long time in birth registration. And so when I talk about CRVS today, I'll mostly be talking about re birth registration. We do have interest in the other vital events as well. Um, but we come from a space where, like UNICEF, Save the Children and other child rights agencies, where we've been encouraging people, um, parents, to have their children registered wherever they are in the world because they unlock so many of their other rights. We by our own estimations, responsible for supporting the registration of, of over a million children, which sounds like a big number, but actually it's not really in the scheme of things across the world. In looking at, at the barriers to registration, we realised that um, government systems and the support for those um, in a space that's dominated by paper-based quite archaic sort of system, very centralised often in capital cities, was creating the sort of barriers that we then struggle to deal with later on. So I'll just, because I've got a little bit of time, I'm going to give one anecdote, which is the kind of driving reason for us to get involved in open CRPS. And there's a situation in a particular country, not in the Pacific, um, 
where CRVS birth registration is very centralised. Uh, a birth happens in a, a regional or remote area. The parents have to take the child to the capital city, line up for a couple of days, pay some money to get the birth certificate issued. For people of modest means, that's a very big barrier. Um, in this particular country, um, that would mean that Many parents don't bother to register their children, or if they do, they may register their boys and not their girls because they see that there's a value in doing that. Now, in this particular country, you can't enrol in primary school without a birth certificate. So immediately that creates a barrier, um, a fundamental barrier. There's a whole range of others, passports, access to finance if you want to borrow money, um, whole range of things and in terms of others I'll, I'll get off my high horse about this in a minute um we've got a, a, another very strong interest in trying to prevent um child marriage in countries around the world now even in places where we've been able to support the government to enact legislation that prevents child marriage if you can't prove how old the child is you can't enact that legislation and so it's a fundamental underpinning in a lot of different places so that's the reason why people say you're, a, you're a, a charity, why are you getting involved in uh, augmenting and improving, improving sovereign government systems? And that's why it's the right, those rights that are unlocked by doing that. Um, one of the things when we started to, to do this, pro, go down this process and we looked at, okay, where are all the barriers? Why aren't people getting, getting their kids registered? It, two things became apparent to us. We were mapping the system for how it worked or how it should work. Uh, and that a digital system seemed to be um, the approach that we should take in doing this to overcome that sort of um, the remoteness barrier. The, the primary issue being, could we have birth certificates issued um, closer to where the birth occurred? So is, rather than a capital city, could that be in a district health clinic with a responsible person in the clinic, a doctor or a nurse? Um, where that where that clinic wasn't there, could it be an out if the birth was attended by a nurse in a village setting or something like that? But again, could the nurse do that, or could a responsible person in the village be trusted to issue that um, that system? Being uh, sometimes it's there's a benefit being an NGO or a charity. Um, people are often uh, offer you sort of pro bono assistance and support. And in the early days, that was a uh, a global firm called Accenture that helped us map out the sort of business systems and start to do the initial work on that. And so we realised uh, without even um, kind of realising to start that we were creating a digital public good, one that was a benefit for a, whole, a broad range of people, um, and that there was some processes and like it being open source that became important for how that was done. Um, one of the barriers we see for other CRVS systems is they are proprietary. Countries have to pay license fees for them. Sometimes there's a bit of murkiness around who owns the data or who has control of the data. We didn't want all those to introduce new barriers when we were doing this. We wanted um, a range of people to be able to implement it. We as the NGO do not want to get in the business of being a systems integrator in multiple countries around the world. Actually, we want other systems integrators like BES, for example, to do some of that work. And so um, one of the things NGOs are actually not too bad at is piloting stuff. And we heard about pilotitis and we recognize that as well. We think we play a, a, a good role to uh, generating new ideas, starting new things off and going. Um, but um, oftentimes we get to a uh, um, sort of minimum viable product and then things fall off the cliff because we're not a commercial organisation. We're not there to take things to scale necessarily. And, and actually there's a bit of a challenge um, with some donors in this space. So what we've, our experience to date is that um, governments, because we're dealing with a quite a sensitive part of government operations, issuing their birth certificates and citizenship effectively, is a, it's a highly sovereign task. It's, um, some governments uh, have said to us, we don't, do not want NGOs involved with that, this sort of sovereign task. We would rather someone from the private sector 
which we kind of sometimes feel slightly odd, but we, we take it at face value. And, and sometimes we get donors that come to us and say, um, we won't provide money to a private sector partner. This is aid money, and so it has to go to an aid partner. And so we're operating in a bit of an odd space there. Um, and so we created um, OpenCRVS Limited as a, a not-for-profit commercial entity to try and straddle those two worlds. Plan sits on the board with the other initial partners, uh, I, the IP holders, which is Gemby Health Systems, which is kind of a, uh, this is a coarse way of describing it. it, might be an African version of BES. I don't know if that's sort of in that space. Vital Strategies, which is part of the Bloomberg Data for Health, um, and New Legacy Digital, which is um, uh, in itself a kind of entrepreneurial startup business that um, holds some of the uh, original staff that worked for Plan when we were doing this work originally. And we've, we've done our best to meet some global standards around open source digital products like the uh, Digital Public Good Alliance. Um, it's on the UNDP Digital X Register, Digital Square Dial. There's a whole range of them. Um, I should have said at the start, in case you're wondering, um, I'm not a health sector person, nor am I an IT person. Um, so what we'll have questions at the end, and I'll have contacts for you on some of that stuff. Um, if you want to ask me how the code works, uh, those sorts of things, I'm not going to be able to answer those questions. Uh, so just uh, setting that up up front. I, my, my interest in it um, is around those unlocking those rights, trying to remove some barriers, getting birth registration for children. And so I kind of an advocate for it, I guess. Um, but I'll show you some photos of the of the brains trust around it as well. So if you do a web search on opencrvs.org, this is the web page that you'll land on and you'll see some of the narrative around that, around open source. Um, our funding partners for DFAT people in the room, because um, having worked for DFAT previously in the past, where they see that, they're like, who's funding that? Which part of DFAT is that? Um, <laughs> that's that's on there because we, we have a flexible fund that we receive from DFAT called the Australian NGO Cooperation Program. Um, we get a lot of latitude in what we can do with that funding. And so it, in a way it operates like a little mini innovation fund. And so we've been using that to help develop open CRBS. Um, so that's why the Australian aid moniker is on there. Um, there's a range of others there, including ourselves. We put some of our own funding into it. The one I wanted to point out um, is NORAD, the Norwegian aid agency, not a donor you might typically see in the Pacific very much. Um, NORAD see themselves as a global leader in digital public goods. The, the really valuable role they play for OpenCRVS is that they provided funding to plan to get OpenCRVS to its full version 1.0, which was quite important for us. We had our kind of scaled back pilot version prior to that, um, which didn't have the full functionality, which it now does. Um, they encouraged us to help to set up the, the new global entity, and now they core fund the new global entity. Um, it's not everything we would like. We have high ambitions for the organisation, and it's still in that kind of startup phase. But that kind of core support is really crucial for any organisation like this. And they're able to bring some additional resources to us. For example, the penetration testing we do on OpenCRVS, because people often ask, it's open source, how do you protect the data? And the data is protected, is a secure environment. And NORAD provide third party penetration testing on versions of it so that we can ensure that, that um, it is safe and secure. So that's, it's kind of beyond the funding, the support they, they provide to us. We've heard from others uh, about the importance of users uh, in the system in terms of making sure things are designed well. We want it to be quick and easy. Um, there's quick and easy and there's quick and easy. It does require some systems mapping. What we typically find in most countries around the world, CRVS systems are pretty similar. They contain many of the same fields. The process follows a sort of similar pattern. There are variations around 
um, how fields are constructed, different, uh, whether you need want siblings on your birth certificate. There's a whole range of things that kind of around the margins, but the process is fairly similar, which means we can start with a core product and then just modify that as it goes along. And so you probably can't see that in the back of the room, but that, that's a typical workflow for it. Um, the, the point that I wanted to make around this, around getting certificates um, closer to where the event happens is the two yellow boxes. One is around births that happen in a health facility and the other one is, that is around births that happen in a community. And this is the thing that can be quite different depending on where you are in the world. Uh, in some places, most um, births will happen in a health facility, particularly in small countries. Um, but in larger countries where we're looking at places like Nigeria, Madagascar, Bangladesh, um, a lot of births happen in the community. And they're the ones that are often at risk of being um, not captured in the system. And so we do have a process for offline registration on devices. Um, we call them... Um, that um, it can be some, called a name like a district agent, um, but, but typically that's a responsible person that the government has sort of authorised, whether that is a, a local health clinic manager um, or even a village leader or elder in, in certain circumstances, depending on the kind of district governance that's at place. And then you'll see it run through a, a process around the declaration. Many of you have worked in health settings you know that when a birth happens in a hospital, say in Australia or somewhere in the region, and we talked about this a little bit before, there's a notification of the birth that the doctor will sign. That's not birth registration. That's a notification of that event that then goes into the registration system. And there's some checks and things that go on through that through that declaration and then the validation process, which is really where it comes into the Registrar General sort of domain. Uh, it's then registered, updated. There's some other functionalities that have to go on in there, like correct a record is quite important if you don't have a name to start with. Um, I, we have another sort of unrelated project uh, in the Northern Territory in East Arnhem Land. Um, so it's interesting to hear about the MeWatch Health Connection. Uh, where oftentimes a birth certificate uh, in those communities, it's quite common that it's registered with inverted commas, no name, because the child's not named to start with. It's then important to go back and be able to change that record to put in the name when the child is named for cultural reasons. Otherwise, some of those other interoperable uh, things like, uh, it's often first noticed when someone applies for a Medicare card or a driver's license, they don't have a form of identity with their name on it. So that sort of functionality around correct record becomes important. Um, we've got national ID, health system, social protection uh, is one that we're looking at at the moment. In some places, uh, there may be things like a, um, a payment that's given on the birth of a child, sometimes disaster payments. All these things can be linked back to um, an individual identifier um, if there's a strong CRVS system in place. And of course, the statistics link. Um, so that's the, that's the workflow. All right, the brains trust. This is, uh, these are the three big brains um, that have been with CRVS since it was a planned project, um, not its own sort of spun out thing. Um, Anina, who looks after the um, community development engagement, Ed on product strategy and sustainability, and Ewan, who's who, if you've got IT technical DevOps questions, that's where that's where you would go. Um, the longevity longevity in the relationship with us has been important. Um, Anina worked on it from the early days. Ed was actually the Plan International um, Innovation Officer globally and so helped create OpenCRVS right from the start. Um, very passionate about it, and so has gone on to the new organisation to keep that um, connection going. And then um, it's a small team, that's like the whole team, six people. Um, Jonathan, who helps Ewan with the design work, and as product owner, 
really important function within the organization. We talk about the importance of clients and user services. The product owner plays that role when they're when we're doing development where there is actually no client at that point of view. They take that kind of user perspective into it. And Evelyn on marketing engagement because our money is important. <laughs> we might uh, we might be taking a not-for-profit pro, but it still costs. Um, and so we still need to to try and keep the lights on. And so I said it was going to be kind of short and we were going to catch up and we sort of are, which is great. The, the ask is to, to think about CRVS systems when you're doing your health work. Um, it's really heartening for me to be in a room like this because um, CRVS often doesn't get a lot of love in the international development programs. It kind of falls between the cracks. Um, but when I come to a health setting and I talk to health people, they say to me, CRVS is really important. And that's kind of one of the few spaces where we get that kind of feedback and validation that what we're doing is actually important and useful and people see it that way. Uh, it's just making sure that we can get cobbled together the funding to make sure that we can get that important work done. Um, so do we do consider it? In a perfect world, I would like to think we would have a strong CRVS system and then um, health systems and things like unique health identifiers would be built on that system. But that's not actually the way it works in most places. They have budget for their health. You, you guys have budget for your, for your health initiatives. You build those health systems and then the CRVS is trying to catch up. I guess what we're saying is leave space for those connections because they're still important. Um, and if we think about 20 years down the track, and there is a robust CRVS, digital CRVS system that can feed those numbers in straight away um, and have those information flows. Um, the other, um, just around resilient systems, the other space we hear a little bit of love around CRVS, and I presume it would be the self, same for health, um, digital people, is actually when we talk about climate change, um, when we're talking about the vulnerability in paper-based systems. Um, we talk about mobile populations and accessing their information, including their birth registration documentation. We do um, get some appreciation from that kind of climate change adaptation crew um, that this helps build resilient communities. So we, we appreciate that sort of support and validation as well. Uh, and if you do create the space when you're doing your digital systems, if you do allow for that interoperability to be built in, whether it's right now or a little bit down the track, you will be helping children realise their rights. So that's it. Thank you. I think ooh, one more. This, here's the links <laughs> for the important people. So uh, email address is mine. Of course, you can always contact me, um, Anita and Ed at OpenCRVS, um, and then you and on the technical questions. You find us on the socials. Um, the documentation is all on the website um, around user guides and that sort of thing. The code is in, in GitHub, so you can go and have a look at the code if you are so inclined. Um, and really importantly, on the website, you'll see the community discussion groups. We are trying to facilitate um, different conversations for the IT crowd and the coders and for the government systems users to ask questions, to hear about what's happening in other settings, um, to try and generate that kind of um, cross learnings between different places on that. So um, I encourage you to go to the community page as well. So that's it, that's the last slide, thank you. Um, we have time for questions. So does anyone have any questions for John about open CRVS or digital CRVS systems in general? Long term? Uh, John, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, I hear that um, open CRVS could be implemented um, in the African countries. Uh, the question is, it's a good question because you prompt me to provide a piece of information that I, I was going to mention in the talk. Um, there's the uh, original interest were, had started, it was generated in Africa. We are we as plan, and I have to say within the plan 
we operate in a federal federated model and Plan International Australia is the, the plan partner within our federation. So we have a natural interest in the Pacific. We've demonstrated it um, just pre-COVID to government of Niue. And the thing I was going to mention is that we are implementing it in Niue. We're just contracting at the moment for a full implementation there, which we're very excited by. Um, there's a kind of benefit to starting in a small place because you can do a whole country and demonstrate it quite effectively. You don't, you can skip the kind of pilot phase uh, because it's a sort of, you know, one hospital full implementation. So that's fantastic. Um, but one of the issues was making sure that we had a connection for the systems integration partners and we have that with BES now. The important thing about OpenCRBS is that anyone can pick it up and use it. So governments can tender for someone to implement it. They can just tender. And I understand Samoa has recently tendered for an eCRBS system and OpenCRBS will be one of the tenders, uh, at least one, maybe two of the tenders going in in that place. So it is a, a kind of supply and demand situation around that where we're really... Um, we're really pleased about New Way and we want to make a bit of a song and dance about that when it's done to be able to promote it to other places. Pacific. We're pleased to be working with BES around um, that and we think it's there's opportunity elsewhere in the region. Um, we're just we just at that kind of front end. And that, the interesting thing is we've been working in five or six countries with proof of concept in Africa uh, and it's been big and complicated Nui's made a decision and they actually jumped to the first, the, the front line. That'll be the first full implementation in the world, will be in the Pacific and will be Nui. It's a little like the M supply story with Tonga. Um, so that, that kind of capacity to make a quick decision and say we're going to do it is great. So who was actually the target user for open CRBS? It's our uh, so countries. Why do we initiate the provide first and yes, from the health uh, mm -hmm. um, But the other side of actually officially registration of both that and either is sits with other government initiatives. Yeah, it sits in the just from So I'm not quite sure who's the actual target for CRBS. It it's health, um, but it's somewhat as own birth registration uh, demand. Yeah. So how do you actually try and act or not do it yet? Yeah. Okay. The, the primary partner is the registrar general or the person that provides the actual birth registration, legal registration function. But uh, the early part of, of implementation in a country is that is to gather those partners together and map out how the system works at the moment. And so if it is a notification coming from the health sector, um, that in many places, that's still a paper notification. In the situation in Samoa, that would be part of the, uh, if it was, if it is implemented, would be to work how, how that connection is made. If the registra if legal registration is made in Tamanu, and I'm not sure that's the case, whether that's just a notification of birth that happens in there that's then passed over to the, the Samoan equivalent of the registry, registrar general to issue the, the legal document, um, that would be mapped out in the business process. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's not a question, but what correction? I think um, I made a mistake in my presentation. It's birth record, a recording of a birth, yeah. not so birth registration. Yeah. That's why we have this partnership with um, Samo Bureau Statistics, because the the player is actually the registrar. Yeah. Um, so we had to <clears throat> uh, maintain that relationship because they are in the process of um, acquiring a, a CRDS system. So that by the time they are by the system, we already have that relationship. So that when we recall the birth, it, it seamlessly passes to yep. um, the CRBS um, system. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's great because what would typically happen is a parent or some other person would take that paper notification 
to the Registrar General, but that can all happen in the background. The person can turn up, prove that it, they are the parent of the child and then get the birth certificate issued. That's it's kind of the way the system should work. The other thing I didn't mention, I'm just getting old, um, is that we, we are working with SPC uh, around what plans going to fund some work around interoperability and we're hoping to have a workshop later in the year um, that SPC will host that hopefully will bring in some of these other partners to look more generally at the Pacific around interoperability issues. They're talking about potentially that workshop being in Auckland, but I'm not sure that's set at the moment. That's kind of up to SPC to decide that. But um, the first kind of interoperable thing is getting stats division and health division talking, which is is what's happening at the moment, which is fantastic. Great. We have time for one more. If anyone has a last question. All right then. Well, thank you, John.